If you need a Bible, there's a table back there with some Bibles. Feel free to lift your hand up nice and high and we can have an usher bring you one. If you don't have a Bible, you can keep it. If you don't have a Bible with you, but you just want to follow along, uh, you can just return it back to that table. It's important to get into the Word. All right. Well, if it's your first time here, welcome. My name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors here. Grateful to be here. Grateful to be able to gather around God's Word, with God's people, for God's glory. I keep using the word God because I just want us to understand that these gatherings are are God-centric. So yes, we might leave with something we can apply to our lives, but ultimately we're here for God and for his glory. And even as you apply something to your life, it's, it's unto him, not just for you. So we're, we're a, if you don't know us, we're a, a God-centric church. We want to always be pointing to God because he's what life is all about. Amen? All right. If you have a Bible, let's go to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, if you're using one of our Bibles, you can flip over to page 10. Genesis 22, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 14. Genesis 22, verses 1 to 14. Are we there? Okay. I'll read. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, said Isaac. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they had reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Amen. So before we understand the fullness of what's going on here, you have to understand the backstory. So this man, Abraham, is an elderly gentleman, and he has a a very young son named Isaac. And so if that picture of an elderly man with a really young son seems odd to you, it should, because that's part of the drama of the story. Abraham, at this point, is over 100 years old. We don't know how old, but we know he's over 100, and we know Isaac's between a toddler and a teenager. And over 25 years previous to this event we just read, God appeared to Abraham and he told him, Abraham, I have a plan. I'm going to multiply your descendants. I'm going to make them into a great nation. And I'm going to save the world through those descendants. The problem was Abraham didn't have any descendants. He was 75 years old. His wife Sarah was 65 and they were unable to have children. And so this plan that God gave him was an impossible plan. They, they couldn't have kids. But look at how Abraham responded to this plan that God gave him. If you want to look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. This was Abraham's response to God's plan, which was impossible. It says, Abraham believed the Lord, and God credited it to him as righteousness. 
Abraham believed. He trusted God. He didn't understand how. He didn't understand when. But he believed that God would do what he said he would do. And this is, this is important for us to understand. All that God really wants from humanity, at its simplest space, all God wants from you is to trust him. It's really it. God wants you to trust him, to believe his word. Now, you might say, well, what about holiness? What about the rules? What about going to church? What about giving money? Listen, all of those things at their core are meant to be expressions of trust. That's it. Me going to church is meant to be an expression of my trust in God. Me giving money, me doing good deeds, those are meant to be expressions, evidences, uh, acts of faith. Faith is what God really wants. You can write down James chapter 2, verses 16 to 18. James 2, 16 to 18, I'll paraphrase. James says, faith without works is dead. And then he goes on to say, I will show you my faith by my works. And so good works don't earn you anything with God. God doesn't see you differently or like you more because of your good works. Rather, your good works are evidences. They're expressions of your faith. So Abraham believed God, and God credited righteousness unto him, meaning that when Abraham believed what God said, God saw him as acceptable in his eyes. That is the gospel. That's the gospel. You're saved. You're made right with God. God finds you as acceptable, not by what you do, but through belief. You're saved by grace, through faith in Christ. This is the gospel. So Abraham believed, but what's interesting is, he kind of didn't believe as well. He believed, but his belief was very shaky. His belief was, was imperfect, to say the least. Because when he's 85 years old, 10 years had passed, and God still hadn't given him the son he had promised him. So Abraham and Sarah, his wife, come up with this great idea. They say, you know what? We should help God out. And let me tell you, that is never a good idea. You should never try to help God out. Us helping God out is like, the thing I can liken to it the most is, is if any of you have little kids or, or been around a little kid, and let's say you're doing a Jenga, a Jenga puzzle, and you're on the, the, the final piece, and you're, it's all lopsided and, and uneven, and you're really detailed in trying to pull that last block out, and then a little kid comes and says, let me help. And they just knock the whole thing over and just mess it up, right? You see that image? That's what it's like when we try to help God out. All we do is mess it up. And Abraham and Sarah decided we should help God out, and they messed it all up. They come up with this idea, Sarah's idea, and she says, look, this is what we should do. I have a, a, a slave named Hagar, a servant. You should sleep with her. She should have a son. We'll take him to be our own, and God can build this family and, and do all his stuff through that son. This is a common practice in the Middle East back then. And so they do that, and they have a son, and they name him Ishmael, and God says, thanks, but I, I, I didn't need your help. It's not what I was looking for. Sarah, your wife, she's the one who's going to have a child. So Abraham's 86 years old when all this goes down. Now when he's 100, 14 years later past that, God appears to him and says, now's the time to have the son. And so when Abraham's 100 and Sarah's 90, God opens her womb and graciously blesses her with a son, and they name him Isaac. And this is that son. This is that child that we're looking at in this story. So with all that backstory, I think it's fair to say Isaac is no ordinary child. Okay, every baby's important. Isaac's really, really important. Isaac represents God's ability to do anything. Isaac represents 25 years of waiting by Abraham and Sarah. Isaac represents 25 years of emotional pain and agony that Abraham and Sarah probably went through. And Isaac is the person who the descendants are supposed to come through and who the whole world is supposed to be saved through. So Isaac's a really big deal. And then in this moment, God says, give him back to me. Like, think about that. Give him back. If I'm Abraham... I waited 25 years for this child. I prayed all night with Sarah 25 years for this child. This child is supposed to be who you're supposed to save the world through. And finally, everything's on track, and now you want him back? Listen, 
it's hard to wait on God for things. It takes a lot of faith to wait on the Lord, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a job, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a child. Whether, it takes a lot of faith to wait on God, but it takes even more faith when God gives you what you asked for to give it back to him. When you've tasted it, when you've held it, you've celebrated it, you've experienced it, when God wants it back, that takes a lot of faith. That's when your faith is stretched to the max, and this is the situation that Abraham's in. He's tasted it, he's felt it, and now God says, give him back to me. It was a test, and Abraham passed the test. And I believe Abraham passed the test really because he understood something about God. He understood something about who God is and how God works. And that's what enabled him to, to, to pass this test. And what I hope to do today is, is help us see what, what Abraham saw. Now, when you, if you've been in church for a while, you've probably heard this passage. And I would assume you've heard a pastor say, this passage has been taught this, but it really means this. I don't know. I've heard that many, many times. It's been said this, but this passage is really a foreshadowing of Christ. Or it's really a confirmation of a covenant, or it's really a whatever, whatever, whatever. And it's all true, and it's all good to preach on that. I'm not going to look at it from that angle, though. Today, I'm going to look at it from a very basic, probably the most basic angle that there is. Because to me, when I look at this, I see, I see it deeply connected to, to, to life in the spirit and, and who God is and the realities that flow from that and, and what it means to uh, be a child of God. And so let's go back to verse 6. We're going to look at this conversation between Abraham and Isaac. Twenty-two, verse six. It says Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, "Father, yes, my son. The fire and the wood are here." Isaac said, "But where is the lamb for the burnt offering?" Okay, stop there. So Abraham and Isaac have a need, and Isaac is trying to find out how to have this need met. This is the most basic level. Isaac's trying to figure out, okay, we, we traveled far. We're supposed to sacrifice a lamb. We don't have a lamb. Where are we going to get this lamb? So if you got into his, his thinking, he's saying, I have a need. How am I going to have this need met? That's his line of thinking. And even though this was a real conversation, real person in a specific situation, when I read this, I see a broader application to all of humanity. Because all of humanity is constantly asking that very same question. I have a need, how am I going to have this need met? And that question, believe it or not, can unearth the depths of someone's soul. Because whether you realize it or not, you're constantly asking where your needs are met, and you have a mentality that has been formed connected to resources in life. Everyone has a mentality, a thought process, an angle, a perspective that they have unknowingly adopted regarding to resources and how you get them and how they should be used and how they should be spent. And like I said, you didn't intentionally adopt this mindset. You just sort of got it over the years through your family of origin, through your personal life experiences, through what you've seen on TV, through your culture. And so there's three mentalities connected to resources that I want to briefly look at and as we go through, I assume one of them will identify with you. Now, the point of me sharing these is not to be to make a moral judgment. So as we go through each, I'm not saying this is right and this is wrong. What's probably going to happen is when you hear the mentality that you ascribe to, you're going to think, that's the right way to think. That's not a way, that's the right way, because that's, that's how we are. But the point is not to make a moral statement. The point is to just bring awareness to a thought process and then bring the scripture into that thought process. So the first mentality that I have noticed, this is my personal opinion, that I've noticed that people may adopt is what's called a scarcity mentality. Write that down. Scarcity mentality. At the core of a scarcity mentality is a belief and the belief is this, that resources are scarce. The things that I need in life, food, money, opportunities, jobs, relationships, those things are scarce. Those things are hard to come by. They're limited. So money's limited. 
or spouses or jobs or, or whatever. Th- those things are limited. That's the core belief of someone who has a scarcity mentality. And that belief informs my feelings. Because I believe that, I feel certain feelings or emotions related to resources. So if I believe that resources are scarce, I'm probably going to feel fear when it comes to resources. I believe resources are scarce, so I'm afraid of running out. Or I feel anxiousness because I'm afraid of running out. And so that belief and that feeling is going to drive what I do, how I approach, what I do with my resources. For example, if you go to a restaurant and you try to eat as much as you can, it's likely that you're operating with a scarcity mentality. You don't know the next time you're going to eat or you're going to have food this good, so you want to fill that belly up. Or if you're leaving a restaurant and you start putting chicken wings in your purse, (laughs) for real, or drumsticks in your pocket, you're probably operating under a scarcity mentality. You think this is limited, this is scarce, and so you want to maximize the opportunity. Another example, oftentimes you can be judgmental in the name of morality. So let's not eat this nice dinner. Let's instead eat a bologna sandwich and use that extra $15 that we would have spent on a nice dinner and send that to Africa where they need it more. Not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just identifying that's a scarcity mentality. Or, you know, those people shouldn't have painted their house. What they should have done, their house is fine, They should have saved the money on that paint and sent it to China where there's missionaries. Again, pause. Not making moral judgments. We're not saying they should think that way or they shouldn't think that way. We're identifying a mentality. That's driving their behavior, likely. And so there's different demographics that are potential for a scarcity mentality. One, if you come from meager funds or a meager situation where you had to getting what you needed was difficult. It's, it's your, your potential for forming that sort of mentality. Oftentimes in ministry, ministry people will tend to have a scarcity mentality. Resources are limited, and so that drives how they sort of behave and approach resources, okay? So that's a scarcity mentality. Are we with me so far? Okay, next mentality right down is an earner mentality. And by the way, I'm going to show you next week all these things in Scripture, how, how this actually plays out in Scripture in different situations. The next one's an earner mentality. And at the core belief of an earner mentality is that resources are available to all, and they come by earning them. So I have because I did. It's an earner mentality. I have because I, I worked. I have because I earned. And so because of this belief... You experience certain feelings related to resources. Someone with an earner mentality probably feels proud when it comes to resources. I don't mean pride in 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 an unhealthy way. I just mean like if resources come by earning, you feel proud because you earned it. Or you might feel powerful because you earned what you have. Or you might feel feel, uh, accomplished, right? And so those thoughts... And those feelings are now going to shape my views and my behaviors when it comes to money. Hard work tends to be valued with someone who has an earner mentality. Autonomy and independence tends to be valued with someone who who has an earner mentality because I earned it, so I should get to decide how to spend it. Improving, using resources to, to, to constantly improve quality of life, probably an earner mentality. Again, I've earned it. I have the right to use it how I want, and so I should be able to do this with it. Not right or wrong. This is just what's underneath the line of thinking. Demographics. Typically, middle-class Americans may fall into this category. Most people you know probably have some variant of an earner mentality. Because, again, there's different, there's different nuance to all of it. But at, at the core of it, resources come by earning. Earner mentality. All right. Third one, and then we'll, we'll bring some application to this. It's what's called an entitled mentality. Heard some y'all say, mm, on that one. <laughs> Entitled mentality. What that means is that, at the core belief, is that resources come by entitlement. So I have because I deserve. I get because I'm me. That's the thought process with with someone who has an entitled mentality. And because I have that thought process, I feel certain feelings when it comes to resources. When I get, I feel good. I feel happy because in my mind, justice has been served. If I deserve this and I get this, justice is happening. I feel good. 
If I don't get what I want, I feel angry or sad because I deserve and I'm not getting it. Injustice is happening now. This is how the emotions work. And because of this, because of these views, I have a certain perspective with, with, with resources. I might view resources as unlimited. I might be very generous with resources. I might be very wasteful with resources. Again, because I have a, a disconnect between receiving and work. Or some, and anytime there's a disconnect between work and receiving, your potential for having this sort of mentality when it comes to resources. And you might be listening to this and think, oh, this is for wealthy people. You can be poor and have the same mentality. So you can have a, a kid who grows up in a rich home who has unlimited resources in their mind, who doesn't you know, work for anything, and so they form this idea that resources are unlimited and I get because I deserve. But you can have somebody who's poor, who's on welfare, who doesn't work, who receives from the government, who thinks, oh, resources are unlimited and there's a disconnect between work and between receiving. You can be a middle-class teenager who gets, gets, doesn't work, and thinks, oh, I just deserve what I get. You can be a spouse who doesn't work, who spends all the money, it's, it's all the same thing. You, there's this disconnect between work and resources, and so you think, I get because I deserve, and that drives how you approach and how you uh, spend resources, whether it's money or people or things of that nature. Okay, what do I bring all that up? Because I believe in Abraham's response, we see something different from all those mentalities that I just shared. In Abraham's res response, he has what I call a kingdom mentality, a mentality that should be consistent with all of us who are God's children. All of us should uh, ascribe to this sort of mentality when we look at resources and how we should approach them and how we should spend them. So let's look at verse eight. Let's look at Abraham's response here. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God himself will provide the lamb. When I read this, I found it very interesting the way this is written, Abraham said, God himself will provide. It just seems odd to me. Why say God himself? Why don't you say God will provide? God himself sounds almost redundant. And so I looked at the, the Hebrew for himself and looked at other areas in the Bible where it used that same Hebrew word, and I, I think I gained some insight. I'll show you two examples of it. Okay, write down Genesis chapter 13, verse 11. And also Genesis chapter 30, verse 40. Genesis 13, 11, Genesis 30, verse 40. It says, so Lot chose for himself, that's that word, Hebrew word. Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Genesis 30, verse 40. Jacob set apart the young of the flock by themselves, but made the rest face the streaked and dark-colored animals that belonged to Laban. Thus he made separate flocks for himself and did not put them with Laban's animals. Okay, so in both instances, what that phrase was meant, it, it, it was meant to mean someone was doing something for themselves. They were doing something and behaving in a way that served their own personal agenda. That's what that means. And so the NASB translates this a little bit differently, and I like how it translates this verse. The NASB says that God will provide for himself the lamb. So here's the thing. When Abraham says God himself will provide, he's not being redundant. What I believe he's trying to say is that God will provide it because it's for him. The lamb isn't for us. It's for him. This was his idea, not ours, so he's going to figure it out, not us. It's his plan. It's his project. He's going to figure this out. We're going to rest in that. And this response by Abraham, I believe, reveals something about God and his nature that should be a great encouragement to us. There's something about who God is, and there's something about us that we need to understand about the reality that should flow from who he is. That, that, that means being a child of God. So here's the thing you need to write down about God that Abraham, I believe, is, is, is teaching us through this. Write this down. God always provides for himself. God always provides for himself. The screen might just say provides. I'd encourage you to write down always. God always, always, always provides for himself. What does that mean? God always pays for himself. God always covers his own costs. God always funds his project. If it's his idea, he's going to pay for it. 
If it's his idea, he's going to provide for it. God does not send you out to do his plan and expect you to pay for it. It's just not how he works. Remember, this entire situation was God's idea, not Abraham's. When God appeared to him and said, I'm going to give you a son, that was God's idea, not Abraham's. And then when God said the son's going to come through Sarah, that was God's idea, not Abraham's. And then when God said, sacrifice him to me, that was God's idea, not Abraham's. And so this whole thing was God's idea, not Abraham's. And so Abraham, in this moment, recognizes that and says, you know what? I'm not stressed. I'm going to rest in this truth that God always provides for himself. That is the reality that stems from who he is. I want you to consider this picture for a moment. Let's say there's a, 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 an older gentleman who has three kids. Let's say they're eight, 10, and 12. And this gentleman works a, a very good paying job, but he decides, you know what? I want to do something different. I'm bored with what I'm doing. I'm going to go start a new company in a different state. So he involves his family and they help, you know, figure out his, his plan. So the kids find a realtor and sell his house. And the kids find a realtor in the, in the next state, and they, they, they find the new house they're going to move to. And the kids get on the Internet, and they, they research different facilities and, and put ads out to, to gain staff and, and get the insurances for this new business. So these kids are the real deal. So after two or three months, the father sees the invoices start coming in. So he sees, hey, this house is going to cost us a million dollars, and this staff is going to cost us $500,000 a year, and, and our insurances each month are going to cost us $5,000, and, and the facility is going to cost us $500,000 each year. And so he sees these invoices, and he looks at his kids and says, man, how y'all plan on paying for this? Hold that for a minute. What feelings do you feel when you envision that? Ridiculous. Ridiculous, okay. What other feelings? Think about the emotions. Stress, maybe, maybe confusion. You feel that because the scenario doesn't make sense. This was the father's idea, not the kid's idea. It was his idea to move, not theirs. It was his idea to start the business, not theirs. They were just being good, obedient children following in the plans of their father. So for him to expect them to pay for his plan and his agenda is utterly ridiculous. And yet, we don't tend to apply that same process of thinking when it comes to our heavenly father. We don't always realize that if it's God's plan, God is going to pay for it. God does not give his kids a plan, send them out to execute it, and then expect them to pay for it. That is utterly ridiculous. But yet you can't tell me, you can't tell me that there have not been times in your life when you thought it was your job to fund God's plan. All of us have done that, thinking it's our job to figure this thing out, when really it's been his job the entire time. And that shows our foolishness, but it also shows God's loving, kind, patient grace towards us. That we could be so silly to think something so utterly ridiculous, and yet he would still love us like a loving father and gently and carefully move us along as we figure out what it means to be his children and what it means to live like him, to, 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 to be in his ways. Many times we end up acting just like Abraham, thinking we have to provide for God's plan. That's what Abraham did with, with Hagar. They thought we have to provide the son for God's plan. That's why he slept with Hagar. But the reality was, no, God was going to provide the son because it was his plan. And so if you're a child of God and you're walking in his plans, you need to rest in the reality that he always provides for himself. He always, say always. He always provides for himself. I hope this is a great encouragement to you. Because if you are seeking to obey God in any way, you got to understand God will accomplish what he wants because it's his plan. Go to verse 14, please, of Genesis 22. Verse 14, Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. I love that. That's the reality that should flow from your identity, that verse right there. So I talked about who God is, and now I want to talk about the reality that should flow from, from, from our reality that should stem from who he is. Because God always pays for himself, 
This is your reality. Write it down. Because God always pays for himself, write this down. You are safe in the hands and the plans and the provision of your father. You need to know that. God always pays for himself. Therefore, this is your application. You're safe. You're safe in the hands. You're safe in the plans. And you're safe in the provision of your father. There's peace. There's rest when you understand that. And I want to take that from a concept to a reality for us by his grace for us to live that out, to be a people who really believe they're safe in God's hands, in God's plans, and in God's provision. Okay, in your notes, in, in verse 14, circle, circle, the Lord will provide. In verse 14, the Lord will provide. When you look at the, the original Hebrew word for that, that word for will provide is, is pronounced ra'ah. It's interesting. It literally means to see. That's what it means. So Abraham named the mountain God sees. So why did translators trans translate it as the Lord will provide when Abraham named it God sees? And this is why. When Abraham said God sees, what he meant is God will see to it. God will see to it. When you provide something, what you're doing is you're seeing to it. You're making the arrangements and the preparations necessary for your plan to come about. And so if God has a plan, God will see to it. Whatever needs to happen will happen for that plan to come to fruition. So God will take the initiative to make it happen. God will take the responsibility to make it happen. God will serve as the project manager to make it happen because it's his plan and he always funds his own ideas. This is who he is and this is the reality that stems from us, that we are safe because our father makes sure he covers his own costs and he, he funds his own plans. I hope this is a great encouragement to you. Again, if it's God's plan for you to have that spouse, you will have that spouse. If it's God's plan for you to have that relationship, if it's God's plan for you to have that child, if it's God's plan for you to have that money, if it's God's plan for you to have that job, he will see to it. It will come to fruition, not because of you. You don't have to help him out. You can rest. If it's his plan, he will see to it because he is Jehovah Ra'ah, the God who sees to it. That's who our father is. That's, that's, that's who he is. If it's his idea, he has it covered. And the greatest example of this is the cross. It's the cross. You can write down John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So God had a plan. And his plan was to form a people for himself, a people who would bear his name and who he could send his spirit to and dwell in. He wanted to form a family. Not because he needed to, by the way, but out of, purely out of his grace. So God desired to form a family of sons and daughters of him who would be co-heirs with Christ. Scripture is very clear about this. But that plan had a cost. That plan had a cost. You see, sinful, depraved, unrighteous humans can't dwell with a father who is holy and righteous and blameless. And so mankind had a, literally they had a debt that they couldn't pay. So God stepped in and paid that debt and funded the plan because it was his plan. God stepped in and sent his son to pay for the sins of mankind in order to fulfill the plan that he had from the beginning. And so what we see is that God paid for his plan with himself. This is the gospel. That is the gospel, that God always covers his own costs. And in his great love, he devised a plan to reconcile humanity back to him. And so he paid for that plan with the blood of himself, with the blood of his son. This is the gospel. And the cross is a reminder to all of us that God always pays for his own plans. So my question for you is, is this your reality for real? We're not trying to just have concepts, okay? I'm past that. I hold back my passion because I can probably talk for 45 minutes just about that. 
We're past just learning information. We're trying to move into realities now. And our reality per the scripture is that God always pays for himself. And because of that, we're safe in his hands, in his plans, and in his provision. We don't have to live anxious in fear of how we're going to be provided for or of our protection or of our safety. Because if we're in his plan, he will see to it. Is that your reality? I want to help us bring this or, or move us toward this reality with a couple things for soul work this week. So if you can write it down, here, here's the first thing. This week I want to encourage you to reflect upon those three mentalities I, I, I shared. Scarcity mentality, earner mentality, entitlement mentality. Do some reflecting and, and try to identify if one of those mentalities you have adopted. Not right or wrong. We're just trying to bring awareness. And what you'll find is that, or at least what I found for myself, is that in certain resources, I have different mentalities. And when it comes to food, I tend to have a scarcity mentality. I will put a chicken wing in my pocket, okay? I just, <laughs> I will eat as much as I can. I just, I just have this scarcity mentality for some reason. When it comes to church, I, I, I tend not to have a scarcity mentality. I, I don't try to control people in the church. I, I just, for whatever reason, my mentality hasn't been appropriated in this you know, context. So search for yourself. How do you manage food? How do you manage funds, relationships, opportunities? What sort of mentality have you adopted? And again, this is not your fault. It's not about making right or wrong. It's more about just identifying awareness. So first thing is, what mentality have you probably adopted, and we're gonna, it's, it's good to do that work now because we're going to unpack this further next week and talk about what a kingdom mentality looks like, talk about what is our part in receiving these resources, so we'll get into that in the future, but now we can do some soul work in identifying where we're at mentality-wise. The second thing I want to encourage you to do is memorize Genesis 22, verse 14. Genesis 22, 14. That's a good verse to memorize. Abraham called that place the Lord will provide, and to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Again, because God always pays for himself, you are safe in the hands and the plans and the provisions of your father. God, may this become not just a concept, but our reality together. Amen? Amen. All right. You know what to do this week? Let's, let's do it. Let's pray. Mm. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Ah, I love that. On the mountain of the Lord, God will see to it. That is so good. God, help us believe it. Help us to believe this and live it out. Give us the grace, please. Help us to recognize we are safe. Let us be more concerned about being in your plans than about keeping ourselves safe or worrying about provision. Let us be more centered on connecting with you and dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. Let that be our focus. Everything else will flow from that. So please give us the grace, God. Help us be um, even gracious with ourselves as we reflect upon these mentalities. This shouldn't be a time of shame or condemnation. It's not about right or wrong right now. It's about just awareness. So please uh, <clears throat> reveal to us the different mentalities that we may have adopted and please begin to do the soul work that we might have a kingdom mentality like Abraham. We love you, Lord. We love you, Father. Help us to understand more of who you are so that we can know more of who we are and what that looks like. It's in Christ's name we pray. Everybody say together. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So you got your soul work. Again, I want to encourage you to reflect upon those things and allow God to do the work of, of transforming your, your mindset. But before God can transform your mindset, you have to first identify your mindset, and then you surrender that to him. One other thing, I just want to provide a little balance. You know, when I talk about your safe in God's hands and his plans and his provision, I don't want you to take that and run with it and misapply it. It doesn't mean you live foolish recklessly. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says something interesting when he sends the disciples out. He tells them not to be afraid, but he also tells them be careful. Don't be afraid, but be careful. I tell this to my kids all the time. I told to my son yesterday. I don't want you scared of anything, but I want you to be careful. There's this balance. You don't just go living recklessly in the name of God provides and I'm going to be protected. That's not. That's putting the Lord to the test. That's what Satan tempted Jesus to do, by the way. Jump off this cliff because he will catch you with his angels. That's just not, that's not the proper application of how God works. You're safe in his plans. You're safe in his provision. 
And so, yes, we are not afraid, but we should be careful in all matters as well. So there's this tender balance between trusting in the Lord and in human responsibility, which we'll try to unpack in uh, some of the, the coming weeks. But for now, be careful, don't be afraid, and, and press into the soul work, and we'll continue to grow together. If you're new, again, welcome. Our prayer team will be here. We'd love to pray with you, encourage you about anything. If you are someone who is new to the faith, never been baptized or not even in the faith, I, I talk all this stuff about being a child of God, but you're not a child of God. Praise God for that. I, I, I hope you can come to that awareness. Let me pray with you. Let Pastor Matt pray with you. Let us just help you process that so that you can figure out what this means and if you're ready to step into the newness that God made you for. Uh, welcome sinners outside. This is hot, so we, we get that. Um, that's it. God bless you. Know who you are. See you next week. <laughs>